So this might be a little late going up, but I hope you excuse the boom. Because, well, I decided to do this. I decided to do revolutionary battles. I kept going back to my comment response video and the comments on the most popular video last week, the one which had the most comments anyway, and going, I need to check this over with a naval architect. And I've got a very specific friend of my father's, who I go to, who did his apprenticeship not too long after my dad did, and worked with him for many years. So was taught by some of the same people as my father i.e. people who'd actually worked on battleships and actually did take part in their construction. And so, to an extent... My hair's all sort of weird old angles. <sighs> ...have some of the same knowledge as he had on battleship design and construction and the realities of it. It was always fun talking with him and looking at the works of people like John Samida, etc., and going, hmm... I know where you're getting from that in the files, I know which files you're getting that from, but I also know of other files which add, not contradict it, but add more nuance and context onto that. And then I have, of course, the words of my father. And so it's a case of, how can I... This is the annoying thing with being a naval historian sometimes. And annoying thing with being a historian full stop. Rather like with the Argencourt scenario. I know what fits that hole in the history. From all the other information around, I know what fits. I would say there's a 90% certainty in my mind I'm right. And yet, and yet, I can't prove it. There are archives I can go to, and I am going to more and more archives and trying to get more and more information. But I have to go to those archives, and especially without a car, that means. I either have to fly or get the train, and when you're going for more than a couple of days and you're taking the equipment you need, it takes makes more sense sometimes to get the train, because sometimes you're paying as much baggage fees as you are on the flight. And the train in the UK is absolutely friggin' extortionate. I didn't realise quite how extortionate it got, because I was so used to driving all over the place in my car. I thought fuel was expensive. Long distance train travel in the UK is absurd. I mean, seriously. I go to other countries and I travel all sorts of places on the railways. I come to the UK. I'm doing... It's just... The amount they're charging. Anyway, that's off the topic. What means is that the common response video f for last week's delayed. At some point it will come out. It might be a common response video, it might be an amendment to the Jutland with actual working shells video to deal with some of the, well, the quality of comments as well, and some of the obviously, obviously invested research that's gone on. So I thought, well, hang on, I haven't done the second of the revolutionary battles yet. I haven't done the Battle of San Nicolas. I've done the Battle of the Rice Boats, Long Patrol, but I haven't done the Battle of San Nicolas. Eh, I'll do that. I will do it. And it will hopefully be good, and hopefully the sound will all be working fine, and everything will be okay. So, that is what I'm going to do. Now... The Battle of San Nicolas is an interesting one, because it takes place after the Battle of Trafalgar. It takes place at the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the French Revolutionary Wars. It takes place... Well, let's be honest. 35 
years later than the Battle of the Rice Pipes. And yet, it has an impact. It has an impact on a large amount of history. Shameless book plug. Hey, I'm going to have to pay for train tickets or buy a car. And some people do come up with very nice suggestions of cars. And I, they do look lovely, but it's... The, the criteria I always have is, is this a car which I'm going to be happy taking my little cousins in? Because I take them out regularly. And there is no point in me having a car that I'm not happy to take them out in. Which also does tend to exactly guide why I tend to buy vehicles which have an akinness with something called a tank. Volvos. Subarus. Yeah. Also rallying makes sense when you consider some places where some of my relatives live. I, I, I do realise some people drive Chelsea tractors, as we call them in the UK, a, a huge 4 by 4s to go around the um, <clears throat> built-up, wonderfully paved streets of London, let alone the uh, streets of Surrey and various other parts of the home counties. But there are parts of the UK where, frankly, you are driving, when you're, especially when you're onto farmland, etc., where you are driving off-road. There are parts of the country where houses are a long way up mm, a theoretically gravel track. And my family has a proclivity for living in such spaces. In fact, we're kind of strange in my branch of family in that we don't live in such a space. If we end up living in such a space, and I certainly would like to live in such a space in longer term, um, we'll have been gone, gone back to our roots. Anyway, 2nd of March, 1811. The fact that these two battles take place on pretty much the same day just 35 years apart intrigues me. Now, what do we have going on? Well, of course, the Battle of San Nicolas itself takes part in the Argentine War of Independence, which was May 1880 to April 1818. Now, there is no surprise that this took place just after the Anglo-Spanish War, which involves several interesting forays by the British into Argentina, well, into the uh, River Plata, um, and the peninsula. While the Peninsula War is going on, which of course was when Spain was occupied by France, and of course during the uh, wars, many multiple wars of the coalition of the Napoleonic Wars, the various coalitions, the fifth, sixth, and seventh, I do believe. Coalitions. What can I say? There are two things Britain is good at. One, queuing. We have turned it into a national art. Two, coalition building. When we fail to do it, and we learnt in the American Revolutionary War and the Anglo-French War that went on at the same time, in the face of the First League, uh, League of Armed Neutrality, uh, as put together by Catherine the Great, that we were really not good if we ended up being surrounded by enemies, whether they were mildly hostile neutrals or actually concerted enemy forces working together. This was not a good scenario. This is despite us fighting all we are technically considered to lose, despite theoretically ending up with actually in control of more territory after it was over than when we began. It's the def It's a war which is the definition of winning up. I, I, I of losing up, really, rather than and winning down. If you're the French, um, because they the greatest thing they win against the British is the loss of America for Britain, which it's 
terror. It's annoying for Britain, but doesn't really gain the French anything, other than another subsidiary power they have to support and possibly come to the aid of at the time. Because again, this might shock you today when you consider America today and its status and position today. But at that point, it was kind of a baby of nations. It really was. But there's a reason I'm talking about America as much when I'm supposed to be talking about Argentina. Because you have to consider when you're looking at Argentina in this period, you're looking at a nation which has been developing for many, many years. You're looking at multiple nations which have been developing for many years. There is a strong body politic and there is a strong identity already being formed in those countries and what would become those countries. Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, let alone Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay. South America is a ribbon of many, many identities and cultures and cultural fusions. As such, Spain had made several missteps, even before they'd end up being occupied, even before the Anglo-Spanish Wars, where they'd end up fighting Britain. The Spanish had been trying to force the empire to focus on just them. Now, here's a problem. When your empire starts to outstrip your ability to provide it with markets. It's going to look elsewhere. When it outstrips your ability to provide infrastructure for it, it's going to look elsewhere. Now that infrastructure can be having a, significant, a sufficient enough merchant fleet in order to transport supplies between different places within the empire. One of the lessons Britain certainly takes from the Spanish, and this is a how do I put this? This is not really almost a national instinct, but it is, a, it is a, not a national policy. Again, it goes back to the whole video about grand strategy. This is more a part of a national identity. The British keep building merchant ships. They're always building merchant ships. And they're not the fancy liners, which the Germans like to specialise in for the America-Holland line, etc., which I've talked about in a previous video about what could be other options of carrying out a Schlieffen plan without carrying out a Schlieffen plan, i.e. invading Belgium. Germany does really focus on liners. Now, Britain, as I mentioned in that video, focuses in on tramp steamers, general-purpose merchant ships, which will carry a range of goods, a range of capabilities can act as a mail ship can act as all sorts of different things but they will connect the different parts of the empire up together one of the big problems for spain is they put in rules that these places their colonies can only trade with spain uh, with spain with spanish ships and then they don't provide enough ships and this is compounded by the fact they start taking up and using those merchant ships to try and patrol for foreign ships turning up. So to actually reduce their supply of merchant ships even more when it's been a limited supply of merchant ships which has been a key reason for their troubles. And going to war with Britain is never a sensible idea. Why? Because what does Britain tend to do? Now, Britain likes to act as a hoover. There is a reason they build things like town class cruisers in the run up to World War II. They basically produce ships which you're American, you might go, well, hang on, this is not carrying enough guns, it's not carrying... No, 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 but it does have a lot of space for extra crew for prize crews. Why? Because the British like to capture merchant ships and use them. Even in World War II, one of the reasons I, I want to have this conversation with someone who was going, well, you know, the British sank less merchant ships per percentage than the Germans did. Yeah, they did. Have you looked at the capture amounts for the British? Well, you know, that doesn't count. It does count. In fact, it counts doubly, because if you capture a merchant ship off your opponent, not only do you deny them the use of that ship, you gain the use of that ship. Some of the early escort carriers 
I know there's this whole thing about, oh, they were using merchant ships from this line or that line. The British are converting captured sh uh, German ships they've captured. That's it. They have spare merchant holds. Why? Because they've captured all from the Germans and the Italians. The British spend most of World War II capturing ships. They're still doing it right to the end. There's ships they sink and ships they capture. They're always happy to capture a merchant ship. And there is a reason for that. Because the British have built up this history from a long time ago of they know there are problems when they lack merchant ships. And when they lack the ability to escort merchant ships. And if you want a good example of what happens when you don't have enough merchant vessels and you've built an entire empire which is dependent upon your merchant transportation, you have no further look than India in World War II. So... In that scenario, is there any surprise what happens in Argentina? Is there any surprise what happens when the Spanish have done everything they can? And remember, the British have actually been smarter in some ways than the Spanish. They learned from Spanish. They didn't pass laws. They had the imperial preference, etc., from these things going forward. But what they tried to do was just make sure they always had enough merchant ships that no one ever thought to look elsewhere. And it was a fine system. As long as you weren't fighting massive wars and learnt losing lots of merchant ships and didn't have enough to deal with all the other issues you were doing with them. And things like Operation Torch and the operations for Madagascar and all the other things going on at the same time. You and Arctic convoys, all these things take up from your wider supply of merchant vessels. So, when you've got that going on, you suddenly are in a trouble. Consider for the Argentina, the Spanish, and their empire, this is where the Spanish empire starts to die. This is it. We talk about the American-Spanish War. We talk about that in 1899. And things that happen in that as being the death of the Spanish Empire. Well, that's just basically it being recognized what's happened already for the last hundred years. Because what it does is it starts off in this period with Spain prior to this not having enough merchant ships. By the time the Argentine War of Independence and the Peninsula Wars are over, Spain doesn't have an empire in South America anymore. Britain has a de facto empire in South America, in that it's now British merchant ships and British trading ships which have now replaced the Spanish in terms of their dominance. It's the British trading relationships which are important. And Britain had started off going, well, especially during the... Anglo-Spanish War, uh, by invading the River Plate, not with the idea of taking over the whole of the colonies. They didn't want to hold the land. They were after two places, Montevideo and Buenos Aires. Why? Because those were the big ports. And it's kind of consider it the scenario of what will later be done with Hong Kong and China. Um, Britain views controlling of the entreponts, these ports, as the critical areas because if the trade has to go through, A, they have somewhere safe for their merchant vessels to go and anchor. B, it becomes automatically a safe space for other nations' ships to come and anchor because whilst you may or may not like the British, you know there's going to be stability. You know there's going to be a rule of law and order. You know there's going to be sufficient uh, sufficient um, security and safety for you to conduct your trade with minimal fuss. Insurance is going to be cheaper, especially because, again, who controls most of shipping insurance? Britain. So that's what Britain's doing. But Britain sends two uniquely terribly... Um, understaffed uh, invasion forces 
The invasion force that arrives in 1805, the first one, is 1,300 troops brought over on the assistance of Admiral Popham here, who had take, uh, taken 6,300 to take Cape Colony from the Dutch. They took the, uh, they took the Cape Colony with little to no resistance. And they basically said, oh, well, we can take 1,300 from here under this poor gentleman. And we can go and we can take the River Plata. We can go and take the key colonies. Then they take Montevideo. And then they actually go and manage to hold on to Buenos Aires for a few days. But unsurprisingly, a force of 1,300 troops is not enough to hold Buenos Aires. And especially the gentleman in the centre at the top. Far more than this, the gentleman at the top here, who was a bit of a... Um, well, let's put it this way. The one thing you could say is, in comparison to him, both Tsar Paul the First and Tsar Peter the Third and um, Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark, Norway. Talking about the one during the battles of Copenhagen in eighteen oh one and eighteen oh seven. They were all brave. He ran. But they were able to form up militia, arm a decent local militia, and push the British out. The British were already affected by sickness, lack of logistics, and it was literally a scenario where you were always getting a colony of a colony of a colony. In that... You'd probably had enough troops that with the support of the, na and the naval fleet you could have held Montevideo. You could have done it, probably. And fortified and held Montevideo. They didn't bring enough to do, to do both. They just got too excited and went for too much. But, which would have been interesting, because you could have ended up with modern day Uruguay. Uh, would probably have ended up being taken over by the British at the sort of the point, and then would have probably got its independence. Hmm. About the same time as British Honduras, etc. did. Maybe it. Probably early. They have a more developed body politic. But it could have been all sorts of interesting things for World War Two, etc. carrying on. But leaving that to one side... The they went too far. Then the later operation, they turn up with fifteen thousand troops. Great. But when they turn up for the later operation, there's now a far more developed sense of national identity already going on. They've had some actually investment in their defences and security going on. And they've got far more organised. And again, they managed to rally quite large forces. And they managed to basically beat the British. Overwhelm them. If you turned up with the 15,000 the first time around, you probably would have actually managed to achieve the conquest of Montevideo and Buenos Aires. Because that would have been enough troops. The local ones rallied at the time wouldn't have been enough. They just didn't have enough support, didn't have enough stuff entrenched. But the time made a big difference. But if you consider that 15,000 itself is actually bigger than the force sent to take the original Cape Colony. You don't understand why you have some of the issues we have with the Boers. Now, why am I getting into this? Why am I spending this time discussing the British rather than the, uh, the Spanish? Because here is the big thing. You can claim to be the all-powerful nation that's maintaining this colony, but the moment someone starts turning up and treating the area as basically their playground, where they're turning up with what look like suspiciously weak forces, but are still managing to take you and storm you and take Montevideo twice, uh, things start to look a bit... Well, you start to sort of ask questions of, why were you a colony again? What are you exactly offering us? And for the British and the Cape Colony, they turn up with very few troops, but managed to take it over, really, and just enough to do sort of do the job. But the Boers 
instead of going, right then, we need to be overawed by these people, because look at how powerful they are, they were sort of going, yeah, uh, you can have the port, we don't bother about that, that's full of weird people. We'll take our people off and go further inland, and set up those free states. Whereas the British should probably turn up with about 15,000 troops to take the Cape Colony. The Boers might have gone, ah, they really do care about conquering this area, and they've turned up with a lot. The impression left in their memory is going to be of the British turning up and really caring about the area. They turn up with 6,300, and then they dispatched 1,300 straight away. It makes them not feel cared about, and as if Britain is not really interested in them. And that memory lasts. But the same memory affects Spain, and affects the Spanish colonies, because they're going, well, hang on. How much does Spain really care about us? Look at what the British are doing. And then there's people realising, hang on. Spain is being occupied at this point. The Peninsula War breaks out. And two years later, pretty much two years to the month, the Argentine War of Independence begins. Because no one wants to be the colony of a colony of a colony. I. No one wants... If you consider Spain becomes de facto a French colony or a French puppet state. For one of another phrase. No one wants to be the colony of another colony. Because it creates a really stupid situation where you basically go, well, I might as well appeal to the people, instead of appealing to my colonial masters, I might as well appeal to their masters, because it'll be them who'll make the decision anyway. So why bother with a middle person? And the trouble is, again, there's some cultural, historical, you know, the home country reasons for listening to Spain that doesn't work for French it doesn't work for the Fran uh, for France although interesting enough when you start looking at the troops the loyal uh, the rebels that end up hiring well you have uh, Jean Bautista uh, Bautista Aspira who's the CNC of Invincible and he is pictured here he is Maltese we have Hippolyte Bouchard on the Vincent de Mer he is French uh, the other commander, Abel Hirk of America, is also French. The loyalists have Jacinto de Ramato, who's pictured in the center, Spanish. Why? Because the locals don't have much of a naval force themselves. So, they need to A, hire officers who have experience, mostly they're foreigners. But B, their other trouble, especially in their early naval formations before William Brown. Welshman of power. Well, what does William do? William can, of course, speak Spanish and many, many languages and in the local dialect when he needs to. There's many, many interesting things about William Brown, but most of these officers can't. Most of these officers cannot speak Spanish, cannot talk with their local sailors. And for some reason, this means their command structures are interesting and complicated. And despite one being basically a Maltese privateer slash pirate, and the other one being... Mm, we can talk about the French history of um, uh, Bouchard for many, many days, but honestly, Bouchard is an interesting officer. They are in trouble from the beginning. And then we therefore reach what is the Battle of St. Nicholas. Now, this uh, whole scenario, and let me check which is the next slide. This whole scenario comes about because whilst they have the public support, the revolutionaries, they do not have the infrastructure. And 
the Spanish voice fry and the Spanish control have the infrastructure, the local infrastructure, but do not have the support of the home. Because Spain is being occupied by Napoleonic troops, so they can't send a fleet and troops to come and assist. There is no army coming from Spain to reinforce them. There are no fleets of major warships coming from Spain to reinforce them. That just isn't. So, the Royalist authorities in Montevideo managed to maintain control there. And declare a naval blockade of Buenos Aires. The key point is, by maintaining control of Montevideo, the navy there has a base. That's a support for the Spanish fleets in South America and the Atlantic coast. It's a critical key piece of infrastructure and supplies. So, the Junta Grande, the revolutionary government of Buenos Aires, uh, established the, decided to establish a fleet to contest the Spanish Dominion local waters. As said, though, those the officers and their personnel that they chose were interesting. They bought five, bottles, five vessels. They equipped three of them with artillery. We're going to use the phrase artillery because using the phrase cannon should be specifically focused. And the fact is that even some of these, the cannon they had would not have been actually put aboard a merchant ship by many nations in that time because their actual utility and viability as a cannon for a ship is um, questionable. Now, they were, the three ships, a schooner, a brigantine, and a sloop. The schooner, christened Invincible. The brigantine, Vincente de Mel. And the sloop, America. Now, you might have heard I haven't used the word frigate, or ship of the line, or any in term of rating of these vessels at all. This gives you a strong idea of what we're talking about. So, they are small ships. They are minimalist ships. And they are armed with artillery of vagrant history. And they are crewed by a crew of people who have never been to sea or served on ships mostly before, and officered by people who do not speak the same language as their crew. Let's think through that through. Does any of that sound like a good scenario to be in? If not, please comment below saying a na. And that is spelt A Y E N A H. Space between the E and the N. Now, this fleet still tries its best and um, they are sent to do what is considered the classically worst scenario you can do reinforce failure yes okay their first their only mission after being formed up was to send some support take some support to the very small army of Manuel Belgrano why? Because that army had been sent to Paraguay to help the locals join the revolution. But they had an initial victory at the Battle of Camichello, and then was defeated at the Battle of Paraguay when he found that actually the majority of locals did not want to join the revolution, especially not a revolution controlled by the locals from um, Argentina and Buenos Aires, because these are the locals from Paraguay who have very different views on things than the locals from Argentina. They still don't want the Spanish there. They're, they're very, very, they, they, it's one of the things. They share in the revolutionary fervor. They do not share in wanting to be ruled from Buenos Aires. They do not want to exchange that from the Paraguay. It's a, it's, 
it's a classic realization of issues. Anyway, unfortunately, the junta decide to reinforce Belgrade, as mentioned, and they send Espada with the transport with the transport ships and his three warships to take reinforcement troops and artillery to Paraguay. Unfortunately for Aspardo, Aspardo, uh, our plucky Maltese privateer, the Royalist authorities in Montevideo, the Loyalists, learned of these plans disturbingly quickly. I mean, it's almost as if they had the junta absolutely wired for sound. And detached the flotilla to intercept the rebels. Now, the flot uh, flotilla is um, in a slightly better formation than our oh, plucky, plucky uh, rebels. When I say a slightly better formation, um, for the rebels, they have one. Br uh, they have one brig, the Burgatine, uh, otherwise known as a Burgatine in local, uh, uh, local phraseology, the Vincent de Mer. Well. The Loyalists have two, the Berlin and the Cecine. They have two <sighs> vessels which are, well, how do I put this politely? Decently sized. Um, I'd say probably equivalent, uh, probably equivalent to the, um, the, the sloop. Definitely the Berlin, uh, well... Yeah, definitely equivalent to the Belanda, the, the, Belanda, the sloop, and the these are Falu, called Falushos, uh, Fama and San Martini, and then they have the Loshon and the Balandra Amada, Balandra Mercantante, and the Galante Mercante, uh, which basically are some supply ships. They have. A large enough fleet that they have a lot more firepower already. And then, well, it's always a good idea. This is this this shows you have great faith in your scenario. This is years after Copenhagen, after the Battle of Nile. And Aspardo makes the decision. He arrives near San Nicolas. A point on the Rio Panana and Parana. And they see the Royalists, the Loyalists in front of them. And Aspara decided to do battle. He decided he couldn't run away, and the fleet was definitely not fast enough or swift or skilled enough on the sail to get away. So he ordered a battery of cannons removed from the ships and installed on the coast. And a regiment of sailors and militias made ready to fight from the river and coast. And on the 2nd of March, they fight. The Royalist ships closed the rebels. And the two brigs of the rebel of the Royals, the uh, Belen and Sassine, actually became grounded near the coast and were solid targets for the coastal cannons and the rebel infantry. However, they didn't manage to board them as they didn't have enough boats and those ships managed to free themselves and retreat. This is going to cause more trouble later. Several hours later, after our good friend, Jacinto da Ramata, had had a conversation with subordinates and explained to them the facts of life, in a very, very encouraging manner, but also the facts of life, the royalists renewed their attack. And they managed to shot at, uh, sh and shot at the Invincible. The America was hit several times, and the America, of course, is number for ship number three. She managed to have a huge chunk of her prow taken out, which meant a lot of water started to come in, and she had to be abandoned by her crew. She's the one at the back of their forces, so she's the one in the most defensible position. 
The role is then concentrated on the vicenta of the male. Number two. Which they tried to board. But the poorly uh, trained crew, who didn't understand what Bouchard was shouting at them, actually abandoned ship by jumping overboard, rather than staying with him to defend the ship. At this point, Invincible is surrounded. And the Royalists board her. Now, the thing is, because he didn't have the boats, those troops which he put ashore couldn't come out and help him. And despite the crew fighting very bravely for roughly two hours, the situation became our state. Uh, uh, became <sighs> the phrase used by so many authors and historians is unsustainable. But let's be honest, it became untenable. That's the actual military phrase you should be using. It's not no point of sustaining it. It's is this position tenable or not? If it's not, you withdraw. Aspardo tried to well, when I say tried, was preparing to blow up the munitions, but the wounded begged him not to, and so he was forced to surrender. This is the destruction of fleet, and until William Brown comes out and starts doing all his victories they have no navy and that's not started really to 1813 Belgrano's army was attacked and defeated the Battle of Takuri and yeah this ends the naval part of the war for the next two years. And William Brown's an interesting character. The blame is all put on Asparta, and honestly the Junta censor him and tell, say he's never going to become, he can never serve in the, uh, in, in the forces again in the command position and all sorts of things. And he's almost executed by the Spanish back in the theatre. But um, he's spared, survives, gets back, and the the Junta eventually withdraw their previous censure of him. And let's be honest, it's classic blaming the guy in command when, frankly, at no point did anyone set him up to succeed. This is operation entirely depends on them having surprise for any chance of success with the ships they've built, uh, well, they've acquired, and they lose surprise. At that point, his order should have been withdraw, withdraw, withdraw. Now, consequences of all this. Well, a few years later, a guy called William Brown gets command. And William Brown is an amazing contradiction in history. <clears throat> now, He's born in Ireland in June 1777. He immigrates with his father to Baltimore, Maryland in 1793. Apparently. So, by my count, that's when he's... Well... 16 years old. Which in the 18th century means you're already getting up there as an adult. Now, when he got there, both his father and the friend who was taking care of them died from yellow fever. Okay. And then one morning, he's wandering along the banks of the Lower River, and he meets a captain of a ship then moored in port. The captain inquired if he wanted employment, and Brown agreed. The captain then engaged him as a cabin boy. And he worked his way up to and he worked his way up to captaincy of a merchant vessel. Okay, this A doesn't make sense. By the way, when you're 16, you're too old to be a cabin boy. They're usually a lot younger. We're talking eight to nine, maybe ten. This, the, the whole history starts to ring a bit fishy 
with William Brown. And from that point on, we know very little about his early life. In fact, it's been suggested by some that he might have been illegitimate and took his brother, mother's surname and his father's surname was actually Gannon, not Brown. We have no idea, really. After ten years at sea, so we must consider roughly 1803, Because if he was 1793 when he goes to Philadelphia and his parents are it's 10 years at sea, 1803. He has skilled, uh, developed his skills and reached the captain of a uh, rank of captain. Again, this doesn't make sense. You've got to, A, merchant vessels, they become master, etc. Mate and master. But 10 years at sea is probably not enough time. But yeah, he's 26 by this point. I would expect him to be in his 30s. <clears throat> But it's, it's potential. But then come with some more interesting points about his history. He apparently at this point is press-ganged into a Royal Navy warship. Now, masters have their certificates. And you can't press, under British law, a master of a vessel, a captain. You can press his crew, but you can't press the master. Because the master is legally attached to that ship. It's a protected a possession... Uh, profession. You cannot do this. So if he has the captain at the rank of captain, if he's a master or a master's mate aboard a merchant ship, he cannot be pressed. Gets even more interesting. Of course, press ganging is known. It's one of the reasons for given for the War of 1812 for the American, uh, for the British impression of American sailors, but in a nice way, whether this guy is American or not is an interesting scenario because we know he was born in Ireland, raised in Ireland, gets to goes to America when he's 16 years old, and then goes off to sea for 10 years. So, is he American citizen? Is he not? This is this is a questionable thing. During the Napoleonic Wars, Brown claims to have escaped the ship he was serving on, which was a galley, and scuttled the vessel. So we're looking for a galley in Royal Navy service in 1803 or afterwards that then gets sunk and lost. I can't find any. I could have missed it. There could be one. I, I, I do not claim to be the inexhaustible resource on every single ship the Royal Navy had in service in the Napoleonic Wars. But galleys, and as a naval personnel... Merchant sailor, etc. We have to presume he knows what he's talking about. Doesn't sound quite right to me. And the French didn't believe in him either. Also, the Br it's not just a galley. It's a galley which sinks in mysterious circumstances. You've got to look for. He sunk, scuttled, and survived again. How, how did he sink it? How? Did he set it alight? Did he bore a hole in it? Again, you're going to have to do a lot of effort to sink a wooden ship. Especially with the rest of the crew on board. You know, they, the rest of the crew don't tend to sit around going, Oh, look, that guy's trying to sink the ship we're on. Ah. Oh. Let's watch him and see how well he does. It doesn't work like that. On being transferred from Lorient to Metz, he escapes, disguised in a French officer's uniform, and seems to be an undoubted linguist at this point. He's recaptured, and then in prison in the fortress of Verdun. In 1809, he escapes there from there in the company of a British army officer named Clutchwell, who is another interesting character, and eventually reaches German territory. He he goes back to England. We're not sure why he goes back to England here at this point, because if he's American by this point, sure he'd go back to America, but also if he's with his Irish history, surely he'd go back to Ireland. But no, he goes to England. He renounces his maritime career for a very, very short time, and on the 29th of July, 1809, he marries Elizabeth Shitty. 
in Kent. They agree that because she's a Protestant, he's a Catholic, they will raise their sons as Catholics and their daughters as Protestants, to make it fair. And then, despite renouncing his maritime career in 1809, he leaves the same year for Rio de la Plata on board the Belmond and sets himself up as a merchant in Montevideo, Uruguay. He becomes part owner of a ship called the Eliza that was trading between Montevideo and Buenos Aires. And when the Eliza ran aground, Brown carried his cargo inland and disposed of it profitably. He then crosses the Andes to Chile, where he manages to have sufficient finance to purchase a schooner, it must have been a tremendously valuable cargo, called Industria. And using this vessel and the crew he'd hired and all the other fees he'd paid, he starts a regular sailing packet service between Uruguay and Argentina. Okay, so far, let's consider this. This is a guy who's tried to talk himself into French service with a very bad story, but then escaped with British officers of interesting nature, has married an English woman, has magically managed to get promoted up with supposedly minimal years of experience of the sea. It's enough. It's a vague enough, interesting enough story that you sort of go, hang on, what's going on here? And he named the ship. He was part owner of a ship, but manages to get it named after his wife because let's be honest, it's called Eliza. His wife's called Elizabeth. And then he's doing something which is going to directly undermine Spanish colonial government. Which is a very nice, deniable methodology going on here. But then it gets even more interesting. Because the Spanish destroy his schooner. They destroy his industria. Brown, therefore, gets commissioned as a lieutenant colonel at the service of the Navy and appointed commander-in-chief of the Argentine fleet. Amazing! He's had so much naval experience so far, hasn't he? Apparently he's been just a sailor in the Navy because he was pressed in, which, despite being a master, so he wouldn't get pressed in because he'd be kind of useful. Masters don't get pressed in, they get hired in, please note. Uh, a sailing master is someone who's kind of useful. If you've got them, masters, if it's etc., you have use for them. You aren't going to be impressing them. You need them to run the ship. You don't need to. You don't want to um, force them in. That could cause trouble. Even then, they couldn't scuttle it. One of the one interesting things is that Brown's illegal press ganging and his earlier career in the navy. Um, is what he uses as his reason for him being able to command the Argentine fleet rather than Benjamin Franklin Sivers, who's a registered Canadian merchant, uh, merchant naval personnel, um, who was challenging for right to command. Story, etc. Comes about in this. Uh, comes about in this point. We haven't heard about it previously, but that's where that part of the history comes from. Service was American-born, but um, following the Embargo Act of 1807, had become Canadian to avoid the double taxation imposed on international trade. All fun. And then, from this point on, Brown commands the fleet and actually grows up the Navy and becomes a very successful commander, including ending up fighting... Well, he fights Giuseppe Garibaldi and wins. He, he's a very skilled officer. It's not till 1847 that he returns to Foxford, accompanied by his daughter, Protestant daughter. In 1857, when he dies, he's buried with full military honours, 
and the Argentine government issued a communique with a life of permanent service to the national wars that our homeland has fought since independence. William Brown symbolized the naval glory of the Argentine Republic. General Bartolomeo Mitra said during his uh, burial, Brown in his lifetime, standing on the quarterdeck of the ship, was worth a fleet to us. That's why there are ships named for him to this day. You also find statues of him in Dublin, Ireland, and in various other places. Well, Almirante Brown. Remember Brown is a very interesting career, and um, really, really, despite being supposedly uh, so anti-British that he um, scuttles his own sh and managed to get the ship he's pressed on scuttled, which sounds a very interesting story considering if he had been actually being pressed. Uh, seems to do a lot of in service of what would have been British interest in terms of breaking up and destroying the Spanish Empire without the British having to fight a war over it. Well, they're technically allies with Spain because they're fighting them. You, uh, they're fighting independence with them against the French. <sighs> it's amazing how interesting life can be. So, small battles can have a long reach. They really can. It's an interesting battle. And it's an interesting history of this period in South America. And it shows the maritime connections that were going on. Normally I finish these videos with a question. Honestly, I like Almirante Brown. I like Rezo Admiral Rosensky. I like all those admirals of history which get less attention than others. So, today's question is... Pick an admiral who you don't think other people have heard of and write and mention them in the comments, please. I'd like to see who comes up and maybe I'll try and do some videos about them at some point. Thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoyed. What we've got coming up, we have the Battle of Yemen. The premiere will be on 19th of March. And we have the uh, nuclear power on Tuesday. That's going to be it for one. Thank you for watching, and take care.